All right, I'm on time, Ava. Oh my goodness, that was kind of close, right? We're cutting it a little bit close. Okay, zero viewers right now, so nobody's watching. So we'll just kind of get ready. Uh, I'm gonna make some notes here. Oh, no, not that one. You know, Geico's been around for over 75 years. What, what is this? We now fast forward to the end of this Geico ad so you can get to your video faster. Oh, you know what? Oh, okay. I gotta mute it. I gotta close this. Oh, you know There we go. There we go. I gotta pause it. Then I can go to the chat. Okay. See, I'm getting better at this, Ava. I'm starting to figure this stuff out. It's only hard the first time you do stuff. Well, in my case, maybe like the first three times. <laughs> maybe the first three times you do something. Uh, all right, I think I'm just going to miss 30 minutes of it. It's okay. Alrighty. Okay, so hello, everybody. Um, Gene the Groomer, we got about seven minutes before we actually start the um, Ask the Groomer show. Um, but yeah, I'm going to need to help with trimming ears. Okay, Mandy, Mandy Murillo, um, what kind of uh, issues are you running, in with the, running into with the ears? Um, cause you know, you could be talking about shaving the inside of the ears, like the Cocker Spaniel. Um, uh, we got the photo bomber back there or, um, oh, Eva, uh, this lady Edna, she's saying hi to you. Say hi Edna. <laughs> Active shy now. Okay. Um, but yeah, um, are you talking about like the outside of the ears, trimming the outside, like making it round or, you know, like sizzling around there. There's uh Westy ears, um. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of ways to do ears. So, like, uh, I guess you know, I'll make a video on like on different ways to do ears. Mandy, thank you. I uh, can't get them straight. Okay. Are you talking about like the hair? Because if you can't get the hair straight, that might be because there's a lot of like uh, dead fuzzy hair in there that's uh, kind of keeping it. Like with the chow, that's okay. Like a big chow chow because all that loose dead undercoat. Not, maybe not all it's dead, but you know, a lot of that thick undercoat for a towel, um, it, it actually stacks the coat. It lifts the coat and keeps it up, you know? So it's good for a towel. But if you're talking about like, you know, long ears, yeah, like long ears, and you're trying to get them to lay, you know, straight and long, you know, then a lot of times it's just, um, you know, getting in there with the, with a good uh, middle comb, you know, either of these would work, you know, and just really just, yeah, and the thing is, it's just, just repetition. You just got to go over and over because individually the hairs come out easily, but you know, it's like picking an apple or picking a strawberry or picking blueberries. I've, been all, I've done all these things as a kid in New Jersey. Every summer we would go and pick all these things, fruits and uh, stuff at different orchards because if you picked enough barrels and baskets of them, they would pay you, you know, so that we would earn money that way. Um, but yeah, picking a few blueberries and eating it, no, no problem, easy. But if you're actually harvesting like entire rows and fields of blueberries, then under the hot summer sun, then it becomes really hard work. So same thing with uh, grooming dogs. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in that skin, a lot of dead hair. And so getting a few of them out, you know, it's easy. But if you're going to go in there with something like this, a slicker brush first and go in there and get a lot of that out. And literally, you're going to get a thick layer of dead hair on this brush. And then go in there with the comb. And that should help you know, that the live hairs, because as you're brushing, you're actually uh, training the hair to lay nicely and straight. So, uh, tell them to breed. Uh, video would be great. Okay, still didn't find my grandma. She was getting, oh, here. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm getting a lot of, uh, a lot of people saying that, like, it's hard to find. I, I just got an email today from one of my clients saying, you know, it's, been impossible to find a good groomer for her doodle and they, they specifically told their groomer do not shave and they shaved uh, and, and they're saying that it's just they, you know he just looks nicer shaved um, but that's not what the customer wanted so you know it's just it's just really I guess I hear it I've been from Atlanta to Arizona to Utah and back and I have groomers from um, you know Germany I have groomers from Brazil 
Uh, I have German, you know, I have groomers every all over the world, and it seems like this um, is like you know, and and you know, adopt pet owners all over the world. You know, this is just seems going to be like the thing. It's it's tough to find good groomers, and good and gr groomers are saying it's tough to find good clients to work with. So I think it's just miscommunication, maybe. Maybe it's just uh, you know, we're not really communicating well on both sides. Um, you know, I don't know, but. And also um, education on, on both sides, you know, ed educating the groomers, educating the clients, you know, on what the dogs really need, um, you know, on, scientifically, because there is a science to this. There is a science to grooming. There's an art to it. So uh, what about cleaning the eyes? Uh, cleaning the eyes, um, I, I, what I like to do is get like a little face comb. So it's like a little comb, like a flea comb pretty much with the little thin bristles and you can get that. And also um, you can get a fine stripping knife or a face stripping knife. And it's going to be like a triangular little, um, like a firminator type of, you know, it's a blade pretty much. It looks like a little little blade. But anyways, you can get those uh, stripping knives and, uh, or carding tools and pull out those dead ho hairs. Also, pull it this way. That way you're going to be training those hairs, the live hairs that are left behind. You're going to be training it to lay flat like that. That way the tear stains um, and, you know, the moisture will be able to travel down rather than, you know, kind of hanging out there and getting moist and nasty, um, you know, just stuck on those dead hairs. So we get those dead hairs out, clear out the dead hairs because every single day you're going to have more dead hairs because that's just how it works every single day the dog's skin is producing 60 to 70 feet of hair a day um and sh during the shedding season even more you know so i mean you know it, it, they're all cycling they're all in different life cycles so it's just every day just clearing out those dead hairs um, and brushing it in that direction so that the, the moisture lays that you know go flows that way down the face rather than getting yucky uh, about the previous groomers, they burned my shoes and neck blades. Ah, oh, man. And, you know, it could have been the blade. It also could have been that um, a lot of groomers don't uh, clean clean their clipper blades, you know, during the grooms, yeah. between dog to dog. Um, even, you know, when you're switching blades from you know, you're working on the same dog, you know, cool it down, lubricate it. Um, and, and there's also other oils and things like that, lubricants you can use. Yeah, no, I'm reading the questions. <laughs> Sometimes what the clients want is not best for the Yes, that's true. That's why I'm, I'm saying like an educated groomer can educate the client and, and um, tell them, re explain reasons why in a very caring way, you know, um, in a gentle way, um, why what they're asking us to do to their dog may not be the best thing. Um, and if we care enough, it, it will come through, you know, genuinely. And because one of the fastest way to offend somebody is tell them they were wrong, you know, or, you know, say, they say, Hey, you're wrong. That's one of the fastest way to get somebody upset. So, um, you know, explaining it in a way where, um, you know, I like to relate to people, you know, because before I got into grooming, before I learned all this, I didn't know, you know, so I like to relate to them and meet them there and, you know, explain to them, but you know, this is what I've learned and this is why, um, it's actually not good to do that. You know, I'm sweating because, Oh man, I was rushing to make it. Okay, so it's three o'clock. Um, let's see here, 12 people watching. Alrighty, so today I just wanted to bring up some notes. Today I got a special guest. He's gonna be calling me in about 15 minutes. <clears throat> His name is uh, Dr. Chris Blazina. And I hope, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Chris Blazina. And um, I got an email from, uh, Heather, Heather uh, emailed me. I guess she's like his uh, PR rep person, but um, got us in touch. He is a psychologist, um, and he's he's a, like he's specializes in men's psychology. He's written three books, and this book in particular, "When Man Meets Dog," um, is it a winner of the National Indie Excellence Awards, Men's Health. But anyways, uh, besides all that, I was actually reading a lot of, about him, and what I really like is that. What he's trying to do is uh, share his story about how the how two shelter dogs not only change the trajectory of his own life, but how he redefines what it means to be a man in society. Whoa! Like, uh, I guess these two shelter dogs that he had completely changed his whole perspective on man's role in society. I guess I don't know, but uh, and what I was interested in is, um, 
you know, because I wrote the art of grooming, the language of touch, you know, and all these things. And because he is a doctor and a psychologist, I just wanted to see, um, you know, listen, hear his his point of view and uh, what inspired him to write books, first of all, um, and write a book about it and things like that, and share his story a little bit. But also, if open it up to questions, uh, viewers. If anybody has uh, questions for uh, Dr. Blazina when he's on with me, and uh, I told him to call 315, so I have time to introduce and get, you know, set it up. But I'm really excited. Um, I'm going to ask him personally, um, like, what physiological, like, biological effects does it have on on humans and dogs when we when we groom them, when we when we brush them and touch them and clean their ears. You know, because I know that when my wife, um, I personally don't like it, but she likes to kind of pick earwax out of my ears. I don't know if she's gonna be embarrassed about that. But anyways, um, you know, or get a massage, or you know, when my when I was younger, when I was a kid, when my mom used to, you know, run, run her fingers through my hair, you know, huge like uh, just feel good um, hormones and stuff. You know, like I, I don't know, like, like not hormones. I don't want to say hormones with my mom. That's crazy. But anyways, uh, but you know, just chemicals in our brain, those feel good chemicals um, going off. Um, like, what exactly? Uh, okay, you can create dash style. Okay. Honey, read. Actually, read it. Don't just read it to yourself, just in case there's other people. Okay, so Edna, Edna is saying, well, the, the viewers can see it, but Edna is saying, uh, my wife's always right, though, by the way. She's saying, read it out loud rather than to myself. Okay, so Mandy was saying, but sometimes what the client wants is not best for the dog, though. So that was uh, what I was talking about. Um, and then saying, uh, you can create a hashtag so we can ask you select among those questions. Okay. it's a good idea. Any suggestion on which product to use on an Afghan hound? Afghan hounds, so they have long hair. So you want something with collagen in it. Um, and also because they do have like kind of a double coat, you want to because they have some undercoat. Um, you know, collagen and minerals. Minerals really help strengthen those hairs, hair fibers, and and, and you know, in, in inject like a nice nutrients, like what the it feeds and you know, minerals into the skin um, when you do the soak. So something with uh, minerals, um, collagen. Um, and, you know, honestly. With long-haired dogs, I've been having a lot of success with this. And Biogroom's um, hypoactive, I don't know if you guys can focus on that, but um, it's it, by Envirogroom, it's a grapefruit shampoo called hypoactive. Um, I, I've been having a lot of success with that. But honestly, I covered this in the last video too. Uh, I don't think the products matter as much as the physical work that goes in, the carding, you know, the sweat, you know, the brushing. Okay, Marty V. Just got here. Marty 3V, now I'm confused. Okay. Okay, okay, I uh, got you. Okay, I think Marty, Marty, you and I, I think we got it at the same time here. Um, and uh, Marty, you can type here, he answers quickly. Okay, perfect. Ah, I got a link, nice. <laughs> From Marty, is Marty a boy or a girl? Hey, you know what, I don't care, I'll take it. <laughs> um, so we're gonna be speaking with uh, Dr. Chris Lazina, in just a few moments, this is uh, my friend Leon from Trinidad. He's a groomer in Trinidad that I met through YouTube. Um, now we're friends on Facebook. Oh my goodness. Um, anyways, thank you so much for your support. Man, Leon, we're bros. He knows, you know. Actually, stop bugging me so much, Leon. <laughs> no, <I was> <laughs> it's an inside joke. He's so he's so nice. And he's, he's like, oh, you know, I hope I'm not bothering you. I hope I'm not taking up too much of your time. And, you know, I, I like to mess with people sometimes, especially when I get to know them. I'm like, actually, you are taking your, your, your nuisance. You know, get off my back. <laughs> but, I, no, I, I love Leah. And I only, I only mess with people that I like. You know, if I don't know somebody that well, of course, I'm not going to. I'm not going to be like a jerk or anything. Um, Marty, she was talking to me. Sorry for the delay. Okay. Girl, but oh, nice. <laughs> you know what? It's because of the icon. You know, I, I guess I could check your profile, but the icon here is so small. I can't. I just see sunglasses and hair. You know. Um, I love you, Lori. Lori Caltado says, "I love you to groom my dogs." Um, and here's the thing: every everybody that I've taught so far, everyone that shadowed me, and anyone that um, has worked with me, um, 
I, I show them everything I'm doing. I explain it, everything I'm doing step by step. And it's like a three, four hour process. So, you know, I, I, that's why I try to be witty and throw some jokes in there because, you know, you lose them. You lose them after a few minutes, you know? So, um, but it's, I, I tell everybody that I teach, did I do, after, after it's done, like, did I do something so incredibly amazing, like, you know, that, that you couldn't do? Did I do something that requires any, like, natural born talents that I have that you don't? No, like everything that I can do, you can do. Um, and that's why I'm sharing so much because I feel like the results that I get, I'm amazed by them sometimes. I'm just like, oh my God, you know, but I'm not, it's not me. It's the dog's body healing itself. And I'm just giving it the right environment to do so, you know, and just by the knowledge of how to do that, you know? So I, I because of the effect it has on me, that's why I'm sharing this so much. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys know, but um, a few, a lot of people know by now, I, I got fired from my job last week. So, uh, you know, I've been having some time, you know, to really focus on what it is I want to do and is teach and share and of course groom dogs, but more privately now, you know, just going to clients' houses and, you know, picking the dogs up individually and just doing like more private uh, grooming um, and just working on, sharing it, teaching and, and doing things like that. But anyways, I got a lot of calls um, from people and they're just like, dude, you can make so much money right now. I just, you know, like several people, well-meaning people actually um, told me like, just don't stop giving your information away for free. You know, like give people teasers, give people just a little bit, just enough and then charge them, you know? I'm just like, that's, that's just not who I am. That's just not what we're doing, you know? And, I think if this is a lesson to anyone out there, I think that's why my YouTube channel is growing. You know, and that's why everything's because I mean, look at this, the production. Oh, that, that's my old side from my old uh, shop at Buckhead. But you know, production value, everything, nothing, nothing really is amazing about my YouTube videos. You know, and I think it's just that people can, can sense, people can see that I really do just want to help. And I'm, I want to share um, relevant, practical, helpful information. That's gonna help your relationship with your dog because the way your dog looks at you after you give them a proper groom, it's, uh, you just gotta, you just gotta, you just gotta see it for yourself. You gotta feel it. Um, okay, Marty, don't worry, I'll say hello from Italy. Wow, Italy. I've always wanted to go to Italy. Ava wants to go to Italy. Oh my God. We love Italian food. Anyways, um, aren't you late for your piano lesson? Okay, well, I guess you guys, I guess you still have a little time. Okay, I always tell you that. Oh, that's the best way to thin Yorkie's coat. The best way to thin Yorkie's coat, especially if there is a lot of like dead coat in there, I like to use a coat king. And a coat king, um, I also call it a bear claw. And it kind of looks like um, I didn't I bring the coat king. But it, um, I showed it in the last video too, and and you know I have a I have a video called grooming tools where I go over it, and I I love the coat king, but you know just go with the coat king gently, with the grain, with the way the direction that the hair is supposed to lay naturally. You know, don't go against the grain. Mm. Marty, I think the two of the most important things to do while doing this kind of work are passion and experience. Oh my goodness, yes, I I actually just told my wife that the other day, like. I feel like I had to go through everything I went through. I had to go all through all these years um, and, and accumulate the experiences and the knowledge that I have now in order to share at the level I'm sharing now. I couldn't have done it, you know, four years ago, five years ago. Uh, do we have to come to the class or will it be on YouTube? Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it on YouTube because uh, – because it is, it is a paid class and I just feel like it wouldn't be fair to the people that are <clears throat> paying and, you know, coming to Atlanta to attend. I don't think it'd be fair to them to just put it out for everybody else. <clears throat> That's one area where I'm, I'm, I do, I do get it. Like I can't just put that out there because I am going to be telling a lot of personal experiences, a lot of, um, a lot of things I don't share on YouTube, my videos, my books or anything, just very, um, just, you know, specific experiences and things like that. And, you know, um, and, you know, the Q and A, who knows what kind of, uh, questions and answers may come out of there. So I want to kind of keep it private. What happens there 
is going to stay there. Uh, but yeah, great question. I'm glad you asked. Um, it always seems to Matt. Yes. Because um, when you when you're washing those old hairs, those old fuzzy hairs, and when you run your hand through the coat, it should you should feel it. It feels grainy. It doesn't feel smooth and silky. It feels grainy. So like gritty. Those hairs, you want to kind of pull them all out. You can actually just kind of pinch and pull them all out. And once you pull them out, then um, the live hairs, because they have oils and substance to them, they're all sealed up, they're live, they're not going to tangle up and mat so easily. It's because the other ones, the, the fuzzy hair that you're going to be combing and carting out, um, if you look in the mi under a microscope, it actually looks like pi open pine cones or like, like Velcro kind of, you know, and so they're kind of frayed. And so they're going to uh, uh, cling to each other. They're going to attach to each other and mat. And so that's why it continues to mat. Uh, yes, dizzy licious creations. Yes, you are amazing. Oh my goodness, I, I still, I'm still practicing how to respond properly to something like that. You know, like, okay. So I guess you know when someone says you're amazing, I'm gonna say, thank, thank you, thank you. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh oh, funny story, real quick. Because in two minutes, um, Dr. Chris is gonna call. <clears throat> but while I was out in Arizona, pet club. You know, they did this competition where you win a free um, spa package if you do this, um, you know, if you blog about uh, Majamore Mud. And I didn't really know about the competition. I didn't care. You know, I just, I blog and I do things because I feel inspiration to do it. And sometimes I go months without feeling inspired to do anything. So I don't because I feel like it would be ingenuine. It, would, it wouldn't be sincere if I force myself to do these kind of things if I'm not feeling inspired to do it. So I just... You know, I don't, I don't do things for that kind of, uh, to win anything or, you know, so, but anyways, I won. I ended up winning and I didn't know I won. And they had this manager's meeting, all the managers there. Um, this one groomer, um, we had a little bit of a kind of a disagreement on um, their grooming, you know, private grooming page. And, you know, I, you know, I just thought it was, everything's cool, you know, but I could tell there's a little bit of, it was a little bit tense, a little bit awkward, right? And then I had to go to the bathroom. So her and the guy that works with her, I think they were, I think they're partners. I'm not, I'm not sure. But anyways, um, you know, the guy goes, oh, congratulations on winning the competition. And I thought that he was talking about the Facebook uh, drama that we, we hear, you know, that we had a little bit. And so I just, I just told him, oh, thanks. And I went to the bathroom and I didn't know. Because, and then a few days later, I got a, I got a letter where I was working. And I got this like gift package and you know a gift card and you know I, I, and then explaining that I won this contest, and that's when it hit me. I was like, he was congratulating me for winning a competition, legitimately congratulating me. And here I am being a jerk, assuming that they're, you know, calling me out, you know, for me being a jerk, you know. I, uh, anyways, <laughs> so that was uh, man. Anyways, um, that was kind of funny. Uh, I don't know where I was going with that, but um, yeah, I, I, oh, because how to respond to things properly. So yeah, I mean, I should have said, thank you so much, you know, even if I didn't know, or maybe just say, hey, what competition are you talking about? You know, are you talking about the disagreement that we had on Facebook, you know, but anyways, I think there's him. Hello? Yes. Oh, um, I can't really hear you that well. You're breaking up a little bit. Maybe hang up the call back. Maybe I can get it to the phone. Okay. Okay, perfect. Uh, it was a little bit uh, a little bit staticky there. So anyways, um, I really have to learn how to respond appropriately to people sometimes because, yeah, like... Uh, that was it. I acted like a total jerk, and only because I I didn't really know what what they were congratulating me for. I thought it was because of that little online drama that I had a little bit. Um, okay, let's see if this one. Hello. Yes. How are you? I can hear you much better. I was gonna say, are, uh, do you mind if I put you on speaker? Okay. Perfect. Hold on one moment. Okay. Actually. Okay. Let me see if they can hear me. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. 
Are you guys good with this? Um, Dr. Chris, uh, could you say hello to everybody? I want to see if they can actually hear you. Did you guys hear that? Are you guys good? Or I, I actually brought some speakers here that I can hook this up to. Okay, let me see. Thank you. Okay, um, hopefully this won't really affect the audio here. But yes, um, I am so happy that you called. Uh, how are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the program. Uh, appreciate your philosophy about uh, grooming dogs and. Uh, it's good to visit with you. Nice. Thank you so much. Um, I, I actually was uh, reading up about you as well. And um, I, I wanted to ask you, like, tell us a little bit about yourself, about, um, you know, what caused you to start writing books about dogs? You know, because I know your, your specialty was men's psychology. That's right. So um, I've been a psychologist and a professor and researcher for well, more than 20 years now, and a good bit of that is focused on the psychology of men and masculinity, which is basically the ways we're taught to think and act and respond, uh, uh, and how sometimes those ways can be kind of limiting in men's lives and cause trouble with relationships or emotional and physical health. Uh, well, you know, about, uh, about 13 years ago, I. I lost my uh, my dog Kelsey, who was basically my portable family and friend through graduate school and most of my early career. And I didn't really realize at the time that that really kind of added a new dimension to uh, the work that I've been doing with men. It may seem like a natural transition to start talking about man's best friend. And uh, I and I got into this and started looking at some of the research. Uh, trying to think about it in not only my own life, but the other lives that I encountered as a psychologist, and friends, family. And um, it's really been kind of a journey to try to understand why dogs, especially, are so important for us. Uh, not just men, but for everybody who has a connection with an animal companion. Yeah. Um, mm. So uh, in the last couple of months, I published two books. One was a more research oh, book, the first book that looks at exclusively males and their dogs and how those animal companions can have a really positive impact on their lives. And the other book is uh, more of a memoir, more of a personal reflection about, uh, especially the two dogs in my life that have been really influential for me. Yeah, um, when you say that uh, the, the psychology of masculinity, like male psychology is limiting sometimes, um, how so? Well, um, there are these kind of rules. Um, sometimes people refer to them as gender roles, but they're really kind of rules for how boys and men are supposed to conduct themselves. And a lot of times they have uh, sometimes a, a pretty skewed version of those rules, like you can never really let anybody have access to who you are in terms of a more emotional, private way. Uh, like that's a that's a breaking wow. the rule that way, or you can have a rule about yeah. uh, you you show your worth as a man by some type of success or perceived status, and if you don't have that, then you know you're less of a man because of that. Or uh, I think the one I think about too that a client shared with me one time, it's, he was an elderly man in his mid to late seventies, he was telling me about all the things he used to do as a boy, outdoor, hiking, skiing, all types of physical activities. And I remember him very poignantly pausing and saying, well, you know, I can't do any of that stuff anymore, so that must mean I'm less of a man. Mm. And when you take all these things together, uh, they end up uh, kind of isolating many of us who are still impacted by these roles. Yeah. Just in North America, is somewhere between 40 and 70 percent of men are still impacted by one or many of these roles that really restrict their their experience of being with other people and uh, trying to live a good life. And that's in large part where animal companions come in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, you know, the thing is, um, I think. 
you're, you're like you, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but I think we love our dogs so much because there's no judgment there. Like, um, like you know, there's no preconceived ideas from a dog of how we're supposed to act. You know, that's, I think that's around money, and, and I think that's true for anybody who has an uh, animal companion in their life. They it feels like there's a different set of rules operating, and and I think it takes a little special in, in the role or uh, in the middle of the number of men's lives too that. You know, Floyd actually talked about this, that when we're with our dogs, we experience a version of pure love that we don't normally experience That's in true. other human relationships. And yeah. They're very, very clear about who they like and who they don't like, and there are no mixed messages about that. And if, if you're true. a baby man, so to speak, and dogs are eyes, then you really reap the benefits of having their presence in your life. So. That's yeah. one step in trying to understand why they're so important for us. Yeah, you know, honestly, I tell people all the time, uh, grooming is not really what I'm crazy about, you know, because everybody's like, how do you, how did you find your passion? How are you so passionate about dog grooming? And I know that's surprising to a lot of folks. Um, I'm, I'm good at it, and I, I work at it because I do like the artistic part, the haircuts, <clears throat> but the actually grooming, the brushing and combing and you know the sweating I, I i'm not a fan of that but i'm willing to go through it because i love the dog so much and that's why i wouldn't groom a cat only because i love you know i like cats i think they're beautiful it's just i don't have that connection with them so i'm not willing to go through all that for a cat you know i'm not even willing to do it for myself honestly you know like i barely keep myself well groomed it's not like i go get a pedicure or anything but you know uh, I, i'm willing to do this for dogs because i love them so much and it's because they're so accepting and my dog Dexter, for example, like you said, he doesn't, he's not a people person. He growls at people on our walk sometimes. It's embarrassing. This morning, he pulled the leash and tried to go after another dog. You know, he doesn't, he just, he doesn't care what people think about him, but he does with me. Like, the, you know, he really doesn't want to disappoint me. After he pulled the leash and, you know, I was like, Dexter, you know, the way they look at you, they know they disappointed, you know, like they, they want to please you so much. And I don't, I just feel like grooming is just, one of the ways we can show them in a way that they clearly understand in a, in a primal way that's mm -hmm. obvious to them this guy cares about me you know he's brushing me he's cleaning my ears and that was another question that was one of the questions that i had for you <clears throat> uh, because i uh, i have 13 viewers right now but none of them they were asking questions about grooming but now that you're on they're not asking but <clears throat> um i was gonna ask you oh here's a question emma claire um, she's asking, my dog Bella really freaks out at men. She's okay with women and other dogs, but men she barks and runs away from. How can I overcome this? Now, is this more, is this kind of your area or no? You're, you're talking more about the, the effect, that, the impact that has on us emotionally and psychologically, right? Not. That's right. So I'm not so much of a psychologist that focuses on shaping the behavior of dogs, but more like literally how they kind of shape us, how they impact us in a really mm. positive way. So, you know, you were talking about the part about grooming dogs and, uh, you know, when it, it's so interesting that over the last 20 years especially, there's all this research that really has come out in terms of talking about what dogs are capable of in terms of emotional and cognitive abilities and how smart they are. And I just saw a study yesterday that talked about you know, uh, there's this intelligence factor that you can think about for different kinds of dogs. So there's all that research that comes out, and my my part is really on the other side of that in terms of ah uh, yeah when yeah when we understand kind of big presence in our life, how does it impact us in terms of emotions and psychologically? Do we feel safe? And, uh, some of that research has also been booming really in the last 10, 15 years too, and it goes back to studies that happened in the 80s and early 90s that looked at if you had a heart attack, were you more likely to survive the first year if you had a pet or not? And the answer was, you were. You were Whoa. significantly more likely to survive. Wow. Oh. In my book, The Art of Grooming, I did a little research um, about, you know, because I wanted to do some research about uh, the effect touch has on, you know, both the dog and the groomer. I ran across this study that they did in Korea where um, infants 
um, and you know, newborns up to six months, they would uh, come in like a few days, I think it was four days out of the week, but um, the touch, because uh, some of the, the babies that actually got human touch and affection did much better in both physical growth, emotional growth, um, learning abilities, everything. Um, and actually the impact lasted because we revisited those children at 16 years old and the ones that got the physical touch and affection when they were babies at this orphanage, they were still emotionally more stable. They were, you know, just it, the, the impact that that touch had when they were babies lasted a lifetime. And I, w I was, um, I, you know, the reason why I included that was because I, I feel like the, when we touch our dogs, when we groom them, you know, because of the way that it, it, it feels good to them and it feels good to us. And I, I feel like, is there um, like a scientific way to explain what happens when we groom our dogs so that maybe um, more more than like I'm helping my dog, I'm helping my, you know, I'm sweating for my dog. What if we could actually think of it as when I'm doing this, what is it, how is it really benefiting me physically, psychologically? Right, and I think that's a really great question. And I'll take a crack at trying to answer it. Um, at the heart of more, I guess, more contemporary psychology, um, there's the idea that we are the, we're a human animal, that we're hardwired to make and sustain emotional bonds and connections throughout our lifespan. And like you mentioned, if you were an orphan kid and you got more touch, there is a, actually a larger, a greater percent of folks who actually survive. And the other side of that is if you don't get the touch, if you don't have that physical kind of comfort contact when you're a kid, it really impacts you. Yeah. So if we're hardwired to make these connections and really sustain them throughout the whole life, um, that's where you're that physical aspect of being with our dogs really, really is present. The recent research that comes out, uh, and sometimes I ask people to do this, is imagine if your dog is not in front of you, imagine staring at a picture of your dog right now in your mind's eye. And there's a very good likelihood that within 20 to 30 seconds, your body is actually going to start to change. And some of those changes include an increase in what's called the bonding hormone. It's the hormone oxytocin that helps mothers bond with their children. And uh, there's research out there that says mm -hmm. if we sustain this kind of mutual gaze, we look at them and they look at us, that our bonding hormone increases very quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other part that goes with that too is, you know, when we start to, and I guess this is where the grooming part would come in, is when we stroke the fur of our dogs, uh, our heart rate usually goes down and so does our blood pressure. So we enter into like a different, more peaceful state of mind when we connect with them. And hopefully that also has an impact on our dogs as well, allowing them to feel cared for. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, uh, that. This this so this is so in line with everything that I because I I'm I, I feel like what what's uh, kind of different about what I'm doing is that and, and what you know kind of like what's different about what you're doing is you're going at it from the other ends and rather than going about um, dog grooming and teaching people about dog grooming from the haircut side I want to go to the go back to the intentions why are we doing this you know what are we ex ex doing exactly and you know like how is it affecting the dog and how is it affecting me um and this question here i wanted to ask you from naomi clay is it true that our emotions can impact the behavior of a dog well that's actually a very very hot topic right now um so mm. a lot of a lot of what the research has come out is really positive effects on us as human beings if we have a connection with an animal companion. I keep using that phrase and it, an animal companion is by definition a pet that we think about in terms of being a friend or a family member. We have that type of tie to them. Uh, so a lot of the research that's come out so far has really focused on, you know, animal companions having such a positive impact, uh, especially if you're kind of 
uh, a person that might have difficulty connecting with other people and trying to meet that point of social need of bonding. Uh, and for some people, it feels more natural and more at ease uh, to have that bond with uh, a dog uh, for lots of different reasons. The part that's, I think, on the, going to be on the forefront of things in the not too distant future is, um, you know, you probably if maybe you've traveled with someone, been on the plane, seen a, a support animal for somebody who yeah. has anxiety about being in planes or airports, and you know, those folks support that. You know, having their dog present really helps them deal with that anxiety. The part we know less about is, does it have does it take a toll on the dog? And uh, this really shouldn't be a one-sided relationship where we reap all the benefits that are not aware of exactly. how our dogs might be potentially impacted. Exactly, exactly. Now, I, I remind people all the time that dogs have feelings too, you know, and I feel like a lot of the accidents that happen while we're grooming our dogs, it, you know, that happens in the grooming shop. I'm not sure how much you're into the grooming world uh, or familiar with it, but a lot of accidents are happening these days. A lot of dogs are dying and being injured. And I feel like a lot of that may have to do with the fact that um, we're running our fingers through their hair without ever properly introducing ourselves to them or considering that they may have some feelings about this. Just like a stranger, if they walked up to my girls at the playground and ran his finger through their hair, you mm -hmm. know, there would there would obviously be a, a situation <laughs> immediately right. Right. because you don't do that. And so I feel like maybe what we're doing is disrespecting them and we're not even knowing them. We're, we just we take we take the dogs from the owners, put them in kennels and, you know, so they can wait till their, their turn. And they're, they're obviously um, shaken by this and they're trembling a little bit. And then we just rush them through it. And if they if they protest, we muzzle them and we strengthen them even more. And we just push them through the whole grooming process just to get it done within a reasonable amount of time so that, you know, it's a cost effective and also the, the customer is happy because it's done faster, I guess. I don't know, but there's just a lot of things going on. And I feel like it's, it's happening because we're never considering maybe these dogs feel <laughs> a certain way about this, you know? Sure, sure. It can be stressful. And, and uh, again, I think you raised a really important point. Um, whether we're talking about our human companions, friends, significant others, family members, or animal companions, um, we really do right by them by knowing their perspective of what they need. And sometimes we're not always aware of that. And even if our intent is good, uh, if we don't know their perspective and what works for them and what doesn't, then ultimately even the caring, loving relationship is going to have unnecessary strain. Yes, yes. It, just like, for example, um, my wife and I had a lot of unnecessary strain um, until we read the five love languages. And I'm not saying that all of that is true and you have to subscribe to it, but I'm just saying it just gave me a different perspective. And now, um, just by that new understanding, a lot of that strain and tension in the relationship is gone. And I feel like with our dogs as well, if maybe they're not behaving the way we like in certain areas or maybe just at all they're just a bad you know what we what we label as a bad dog maybe there's a certain strain or tension there that's uh that that could be resolved through understanding right right so uh you know i think it's really important with any kind of relationship that we're really understanding the other the other party's perspective and especially in the case of dogs we're not going to be able to verbalize it per se in terms of saying I don't like this or I don't like that but dogs have telltale signs yeah. of uh, stress and strain oh, and yeah. for us to learn more about those and what works for one particular dog may not work for the other especially as it is with human beings if they've had a, a difficult life in shelter or getting adopted or there's some type of abuse or neglect present uh, you know it shapes the way that dogs are going to be able to approach us or, or not so much. So mm -hmm. having some sense about that really, it, I think it really transforms our connection with dogs into a different kind of one, one that's, uh, you know, it, it, it's one that is respectful. They're, they're yeah. not just there for us. The other side of this is how we are there for them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so 
a lot of your research, um, how was it done? Was it done doing like case studies or just people coming in to, you know, sit on your chair, your chair and talk to you? Like how was your, a lot of your research done? Right. So some of these, uh, you know, some of it, I guess I've gathered in different ways. Uh, some of it is uh, former clients who would tell me about their dogs, usually in the context of losing them. And, mm. and it's always a very interesting thing uh, because those type of experiences are like one more one-on-one. -on -one. You know, sometimes they do really reflect what people feel on a more kind of societal level that for a lot of people who have that connection with animal companions and, you know, we're talking about the type of attachments that we can form with them and how they impact us in such a positive way. The other side of the attachment has to do with uh, when we lose them. I mean, as human beings, we're going to live they're about 70 plus or minus five years. Yeah. But, you know, dogs don't live that long, uh, 10, 12, 14 years. And for a lot of us who are so connected to our animal companions, uh, it's not just about understanding the attachment part, but it's also learning about how we potentially face loss. So mm. the ways that I went with doing this, sometimes they are stories that people told me, and sometimes they were former clients. Sometimes they were people that I literally met when I was walking with one of my dogs. And in that moment, my dog became a conduit to somebody else's life story, and they kind of told me their story uh, about the importance of their dogs. and. Then in more scientific ways too, uh, asking nationwide samples uh, of people, and more recently, especially men, to tell me about their stories of attachment and loss and what the bond with an animal companion means in the context of a man's life. Yeah, um, I have another question from Naomi, but um, you know, because since I've kind of gotten to know you a little bit, uh, whether you know it or not, but. Uh, I, th I think that this may be, again, uh, maybe not exactly the, the angle at where you're coming from, but she's asking, um, so would you say that trying to offer comfort to a distressed dog could, uh, to, could worsen its stress in some way? But again, I think that's more animal psychology, like dog behavior, right? It is, but I mean, there's actually a, a study that just recently came out that looked at dogs that were and this is based on pictures from the internet that if you look at the pictures of people hugging their dogs uh, the researcher uh, found that a significant number of those dogs in those snapshots were showing signs of distress and sometimes that can be kind of like a licking like the dogs are kind of panting even though they're not hot or other type of like physical tells that say, oh, the dog is not really comfortable. Mm -hmm, yeah. So uh, some dogs are more comfortable with those hugs that we give them than others. And again, especially if they have a background or a history of, you know, difficult time in the shelter or they were abused or neglected before that, uh, it's going to take them a while to be able to mm -hmm. kind of enjoy that hug in a way that a dog that hasn't experienced those things would be more easily able to. Hmm. So in those situations, I guess uh, a hug, like a physical hug, would probably stress the dog out more, right? Because they're not ready for that. Just just like exactly. if, if somebody tried to hug me and I wasn't ready for that, you know, like, yeah, it, it, yeah. it really makes sense. So it can be a trigger. It can be a trigger to actually making the dog more stressed if part of the thing that they've experienced in the past is human contact leading to really negative consequences like being punished uh, in extreme ways or literally that type of abuse and neglect parts. So, you know, those, uh, we usually think about dogs as all like one prototypical dog that they offer us unconditional love and they don't have any hang-ups. And, you know, the real story there is that just like people, we, we vary in terms of our experiences. And those experiences shape our That's ability to, to be with others, uh, sometimes in rather dramatic ways. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's perfect because um, that really kind of uh, validates uh, what I believe in that um, the best way to approach a groom is to have no strategy, you know, no, no like preconceived plans of mm. how this is going to go when you first, if it's a dog that you've ever met, because yeah, it, it, every dog is different. Every so rather than focus on like a strategy, 
we focus on intentions. You know, I want to help this dog. So how am I going to help this dog? What does this dog need? You know, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's, it's really amazing. Um, so how do you, are you involved in the dog world in the dog industry at all? Like, or is this kind of just, uh, like how, how involved are you in the dog industry? I guess is my question. Right. Uh, you know, my, the way that I'm involved is in more kind of academic and research ways and, okay. uh, you know, uh, trying to raise, uh, and I, I think about it myself in terms of being a, an animal advocate as well. Part of the reason that I do what I do, and probably the core reason is I know how impactful uh, my animal companions have been in my life and the importance of being able to, for me, at least be able to explain why they've been so important. Because uh, I do have people, people that I care about, and they care about me, they will ask, like, well, why was your dog the best way so important, or the one that was after that? And I know for a long time, I really struggled with trying to put this into words. Yeah. And to be able to yeah. have an explanation that's literally satisfying to the person who asked, but really to myself at the end of the day, to be able to say, these are the reasons why those animal companions really touched my life in a significant way. So part of the part of the, the work is really just trying to raise awareness about my experience is not unique. Uh, you know, yeah. there are other folks out there who, for for various reasons, you know, they they dial into this connection with especially the dogs, and uh, it really impacts them. And to really, in a scientific way, be able to potentially explain that. Yeah, I you don't even have to explain it because. Uh, you know, th uh, right now there's only nine viewers, so uh, but this video is gonna get saved. So obviously, uh, you know, it's gonna get watched a lot more. But um, you know, I I I don't I don't tell this no, like very uh, maybe handful of people know this, but I'm just gonna share it because I think this uh, this is like perfect. I, I I can relate perfectly because when I had a two ruptured herniated discs, they were ruptured, and I was just in constant severe pain. Um, I w there was one time where I was laying on, this, on the couch and I took a handful of pills and I, I was going to kill myself. Um, this is before kids, this is before, you know, grooming everything. But I did have my dog Angel. She's 10 years old now, you know, and she was there at the time. And I remember waking up and thinking, well, it didn't work, you know, maybe I should just finish the bottle. And um, I was just so depressed um, and pain. I, I relate to people now who go through pain because it's such a lonely place. No matter how eloquently you can explain it to somebody, they still can't feel it for you. They, like, it's just, you just got to do it alone. And But anyways, I remember the way she looked at me. There was no judgment there, um, just complete acceptance, love. And I wanted to walk her one more time before I, you know, tried it again. And so we walked and after the walk, um, I felt better. and. Yeah, I don't know. And then, you know, there's a times where I struggle with just, you know, just being really depressed and things like that. But it's always the dogs. It's always the dogs that bring me out of it. And it's, I think that um, getting into dog grooming, the reason why I'm so passionate about it, and a lot of my friends don't get it, because I've lost my shop. I've got my car repoed. I, you know, I've, I've, I've just, by anybody's, um, by anybody's measure, I failed. I failed over and over again. But I'm willing to do it because... I, I feel I, I tell some of the people who do know the, of this about me I tell them I was fine with not being here you know I was fine with not resisting not existing so as long as I'm gonna be here as long as I'm gonna be alive I want my life to mean something I wanted to have a purpose and this this is my purpose now you know I want to find a way to help dogs the best I can and this is this is my this is the way I do it you know so oh my goodness like I'm, I'm so glad we connected I'm so glad we talked because it's it just it validates everything for me. Well, I think there are a lot of folks, me included, that I feel uh, that powerful sense of connection and obligation uh, toward our friends, our animal friends, uh, because of different ways they they touched our lives. Uh, and to me, that's that's a very noble reason for doing the things that we do uh, in terms of trying to be advocates for animals or help them have a different experience than maybe they've had before. Uh, again, it's, uh, they do touch our lives, but 
there's an opportunity to give back to them too, and that seems incredibly important to do. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know why. I mean, this is good because this is going to be on uh, the internet, you know. Uh, but I guess because, hey, I figure I got a psychologist on on the air. I might as well get some free <laughs> free therapy, right? But anyways, uh, uh, there's another question here, and I might take a stab at it because um, I have you here uh, because it is kind of like a grooming question. But uh, Leon, he's a groomer from Trinidad. Um, he's asking, does muzzling an aggressive dog give a positive or negative response on the grooming? And I would say, because I use muzzles sometimes, especially if I am working on a, the ears, for example, on a Scottish Terrier that's trying to bite me, you know, especially when I'm in his ears, I'll use a muzzle. So I think um, how you feel about putting the muzzle on is more important. Are you doing it as a punishment? Or are you doing it because you care and you want to do this safely? Like, I think the intention behind putting the muzzle on is more important than is the muzzle on or not? Is this a positive? Because I think how you feel, if you feel negative about it and you're putting it on because you're mad at the dog, then it is a negative. Uh, it does have a negative impact on the grooming experience, in my opinion. Um, and if, but if you're putting it on to be helpful because you care about the dog, um, then I think it has a positive impact. So uh, would you agree, Dr. Chris? Well, yeah, I, I would. Um, I think it, it has a lot to do with it. And one of the reasons why, and again, this is some of all that new research that comes out that it talks about how is it that, you, you know, many of us know this at an intuitive level, that maybe we're having a bad day or we're down or we're angry or whatnot. And yeah, our dog yeah. seems to be able to sense that and respond and sync in terms of where we are emotionally yes. and physically, if you have physical troubles. Um, and that is not by coincidence. We're not really making that up in our head. Um, and, and there are different reasons for this. And one of those reasons has to do with the amazing nose that dogs have. Wow. Just, they would be, the equivalent of this would be able to smell like a spoonful of sugar in two Olympic-sized pools. That's how powerful the nose is. Wow. So a recent study that just came out, uh, maybe you've heard of these types of jobs that dogs do, they're called alerting dogs, and yeah. people have migraines, yeah. migraine coming on, or even with diabetics, when their blood yeah. sugar drops too low, dogs are able to pick up on certain cues that we give off and respond that says, you know, you're having a migraine, you take your medication, or you're having a low blood sugar moment, you know, make sure you take your medication that way. And wow. part of that is uh, a recent study that just came out that tracked in terms of diabetics that they're able to pick up uh, a faint odor in our breath when our blood sugar drops, and that's how they potentially dial into that. So part of it is like a nose thing. So if you're talking about the aspect of grooming and your intent is to be one of kind of loving and caring, there's a very good chance that they're going to sense that uh, probably on a hormonal level. And some of the folks who are talking about uh, being able to kind of track the different smells and emotions or the different sensations our body gives off in our emotional states. So I, I'd have to agree with you that if your intent is more of care, then I think the dogs can experience you in a different way versus an angry and a punish you. Uh, and, and that sends a different kind of message in the dog world where they are like, this is not a safe connection right now. And, I need to bear teeth safe. or brow you. I love how you word that, a safe connection, because that's literally what it, we're connecting with them. And yeah, the dog's feeling like this is not a safe connection we're having right now. Yeah. Wow. Um, so just to help groomers out, because a pet owner, let's just say that we wake up one day, nothing's going right. Most, like, you know, pretty much my Monday through Friday, um, but nothing really is going right. Thing, you know, we're just, things are just, pushing our buttons and we're, we're already feeling a little irritated. For a pet owner, of course they can say, well, I'll just groom my dog another day. But for a pet groomer who is now coming into work in this kind of mood, maybe, maybe fighting through horrible traffic or something or you know something, but they're in this bad mood, what advice would, would you give them before having to start their work day? Because obviously, you know, especially a groomer, a single mother supporting two, you know, she has to groom those dogs that day to make the money. So what advice could you give a groomer in that situation, you know, to get sure. through that day? 
Yeah, and, and I think this is where, you know, our connection with dogs, we're able to almost unconsciously dial into this sometimes. I mean, if you think about it, dogs are the first domesticated animals. We've had friendships with them for at least 8,000 years. Uh, some people track it back much further than that, but even just 8,000 years, that is a successful yeah, a long long-term relationship by any means. Uh, so, you know, I think whether you know, we're talking about grooming or you're coming home from work and you want to be with your dog, with your animal companion, there is something about cleaning, uh, you know, like you're kind of cleaning the plate when you want to connect in a different way. And it's awfully hard to connect uh, when we're in that place of too, too much intensity, whether it's going down, it's angry. And, you know, the thing we don't want to do is make the dog we want to connect with the lightning rod for all those intense feelings. Ah. Uh, in, instead, you know, we can kind of dial into some of the things that really make our relationship so important and vital in our lives of uh, kind of losing ourselves in the moment of feeling this bond with the dog. And, you know, when we talked about a little while ago, you are with the dog and if you pet and stroke their fur or look into their eyes, uh, or relate to them in a particular way, we really, we start to change at the biological level, at the psychological level, even at the social level. Uh, so uh, allowing some of that other stuff to kind of go down the stream, and just like with any connection, we're, we're in the moment, we're present with this, this animal companion we want to try to make a connection with. Wow. And um, we're coming to the end of the hour, but thank you so much for your time and your information. I'm actually, because um, I think Heather offered to send me a free copy of your book, but I'm actually going to buy your book because I want to support you. And, uh, uh, you know, I may I may even uh, use some of your um, material and, and the things, you know, the, the information that I share because I feel like it is relevant. It is re it's completely relevant to grooming. That's great. And I, I do appreciate you having me on the program and I wish you the best in terms of uh, yeah, it's, it's a very unique approach to being with the dogs in terms of grooming them and I think that's that's the next step in terms of where we need to head of not just about what we get it's also giving something back and exactly. I appreciate the intent that the approach grooming the dogs so thanks for letting me be on I appreciate the opportunity to visit yes thank you so much I hope you have a great day and uh, you know have a great uh, weekend coming up here Thanks, you too. You take yeah. care now. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, that was awesome. Oh, my goodness. So, I mean, you know, that just, like, confirms everything that I feel, like, the, the art of grooming. The whole reason why I wrote The Art of Grooming was because I just felt like there was a different way that we could approach the whole grooming process, the way we look at it. And, you know, uh, Dr. Chris is looking, you know, coming, like, trying to present a different way that we can look at the you know, pet owner relationship, the companionship, the, you know, what it does for us and what it does for them and what we can do back for them, you know, and I just love that. But um, there was a question here uh, by Naomi Clay that I wanted to, okay. Okay, so uh, my dog Bella really freaks out at men. She okay? Uh, okay, so this is uh, Emma Claire. My dog Bella, no, that was not, I'm oh, sorry. Was that it? I think that was it, okay, because she was saying, can help her overcome this. Okay, so my dog Bella really freaks out at men. She is okay with women and other dogs, but men she barks and runs away from. How can I help her overcome this? Um, just, just by my, um, obsession with uh, Caesar Milan uh, and you know the dog whisperer I would say and also this conversation with Dr. Chris I mean he was saying that it could have been something some history something that happened that is causing her to have a you know a fear towards men um, and I actually learned this in a, a lunch and learn that I had at uh, Spiritual Center of Atlanta just the other day yesterday <clears throat> but um, Doc, uh, Reverend, Reverend David All, he was actually, he mentioned the six second theory where it's um, only six second moments in our lives that make huge impacts on us. Something like when we were a kid, if a child really wanted to be a singer, 
but maybe was going through puberty or something, you know, the vocal cords are changing and the teacher says, maybe you should mouth the words. You don't really have to sing. And, you know, maybe she did it, at, you know, trying to be nice, but that could have had that six second moment could have had a huge impact on that child and, you know, their singing career, I guess, you know, or potential. So, <clears throat> yeah, um, it could have been anything. It could have been any six moments of that dog's life that could cause her to freak out when she sees men. Um, I know that uh, Dexter, Dex, my dog Dexter, he has a, he has a preference for uh, brunette women, long hair. And I think it's because his original mom, um, Melissa Dwyer, Missy, we call her, we called her Missy when we were working together, but um, at the Sugar Hand Animal Hospital, she was beautiful. Uh, she still is. I mean, she's a beautiful, long br uh, brunette hair. <clears throat> and that was like six years ago. <clears throat> so, um, five years ago, I don't know. But, um, you know, when we're on walks and everything, he'll bark at every other woman or anybody, really, unless they have long brown hair. And so, I mean, it's it's really interesting. You know, we just have to get to know our dogs and, you know, maybe just really kind of observe her and analyze her, you know. And um, it's... Honestly, I don't think anybody could really answer that without actually meeting her and, you know, seeing it in person and seeing the dynamics of the home. But I would say treat it as a challenge, you know, Emma. Um, treat this uh, situation with Bella and men as a kind of a, a project that you can work on, you know, and how fun is that? Okay, so if there are not any questions, any more questions, then... Um, it's almost four o'clock. I really want to thank everybody. Uh, Naomi, Leon, thank you for joining. Um, thank, thank you guys for joining us here. Let me see here. Let me, I just want to make sure there's no... Yeah, and, <clears throat> there were some really good questions there, and I had a great time. Let's see, more comments below. Okay, there it is. Oh, there we go. Leon, was that a vet? No, he's not a vet. Uh, he's a human psychologist. So he specialized in men's psychology and like the psychology of masculinity and what it means to be a male in society and things like that. That's really where his, his specialty lied, lies. Um, but he started to find, he started to see that um, dogs played a huge impact on men's emotional and psychological lives, you know, and in, in our so he started writing about dogs and the impact it had on his own life. So that's where that that's where he's coming from. So he's not a vet. Um, yeah, I think she's calling. Oh, dog beating. She's terrified, but when she's normal, people to ignore. Okay, that makes more sense, Emma. And you know, hey, it just shows how what kind of person you are. You know, to to be willing to take on a dog like this and be understanding and accepting of you know, the, the different things that are, you know, about her personality. Um, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, Linda Bosco said, this is great. Thanks for doing, thank you, Linda. I really appreciate you. Um, Emma Claire, thank you. This has been really good. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Emma. I really, I really enjoyed your participation and your questions were great. Um, Gabrielle Ramirez. Thank you, Mr. G. Thank you, Gabrielle. Oh, man, I, I, I can't believe that people are actually watching this. Like, if, if I knew people were going to be watching it, so many people watching it, I, I wouldn't have told my story. <laughs> that was kidding. Not many people are going to watch it all the way through anyway. So um, only the ones who actually watch it all the way through will actually know my story. Um, every Thursday? Yes, Leon, let's do this every Thursday. Um, Emma Claire, Emma Claire Sandy Ford. Okay, Emma Claire Sandy Ford is what it is. Um, they have helped me. Okay, they have helped me so much with some difficult dogs I've had in my dog salon. I'm really happy. I mean, that that right there. That's why I'm doing this is because I I want real results in in real people's lives, um, and so that I'm trying to make the information as practical as possible as simple as possible, you know, so that, um, so that it'll be easy to apply because even if it is easy to understand and apply, it is, the work is still there, you know, the application. 
<clears throat> so thank you guys so much. I really enjoyed this. Um, any suggestions for next week? Let me know. Email me, jewthegroomer.com. I don't know. jewthegroomer at gmail.com is my email address. Um, but yeah, I'm going to be working on some more videos. Um, I think uh, the next video, maybe I'll work on the ears because there was a question about the ears earlier. So I'll, I'll, the next video I'll do a, the, you know, the, the, the grooming table, that new series that we're doing. So the next episode of the grooming table will be on the ears. Naomi Clay, thank you. I love your videos for grooming difficult distressed dogs. You're an inspiration. Oh my God. Thank you. So here's the amazing thing. About five years ago, I wrote in my journal that I wanted to be an inspiration. You know, I want to, I, I, I wrote that I want to be an inspiration, right? And I just wrote it really big. <clears throat> Driving home from the coin laundry, I think it was off uh, Chambly Tucker Road here in Atlanta. But driving back from the coin laundry, I looked to my right and on the, on the wall, like under a bridge on the white wall, the red letters, red squiggly letters, you know, kind of, kind of looks like the ancient kind of fonts, you know, but it says, be inspired, dot, 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 be inspired, dot, 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 be inspired, dot, 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 <clears throat> in red letters. And it just, you know, like really stood out to me. So I actually took a picture of it with my phone. I took a picture of it and I showed my wife and I, I, I actually texted it to, you know, one of the guys that was working for me at the time. And I was just like, can you believe this? I wrote this in my journal. There's a universe communicating with me, you know? And so my wife was like, oh my God, let's go see it. You know, I want to go see it. So we actually drove that same day to that spot. It wasn't there. Um, the thing is, um, there was other like graffiti or spray painted marks that was uh, whited out. You could see like white, you know, paint over it, covering it up. There was no white paint covering it up. There was no, there was no trace that the that the the words "be inspired" was there three times in red squiggly letters. There was it was not even a trace there. Had I not taken the picture, I don't think that my wife would even believe me. So because you know I I do some crazy stuff. She's she's walked in on me <clears throat> several times while grooming a dog, trying to use the force to get like a brush or something that's across the room to fly into my hand using the force because I'm serious about this stuff, you know. And I tell her. It's not going to work unless I actually try, you know, and believe it. So anyways, uh, it wouldn't have surprised her if she, you know, I said something like that and it turned out not to be true. She probably would have thought like, you know, he's gone nuts. <laughs> but um, yeah, like <clears throat> it's, it's amazing. It really is amazing. But I, the, I guess I, I'm just really, I'm just really pleased that you're saying that I'm an inspiration because I want it to be. And I guess it was because I realized in order to be an inspiration, I must first be inspired. So I, I was talking about that at the beginning of this video too, before we started, like, you know, how sometimes I'll go months without doing anything, you know, because I just don't feel inspired to do it, you know. Um, sanitation trends. <clears throat> uh, Leon, I don't know if you saw the last episode of the grooming, up, the grooming table. I just covered the sanitation. No, no, no. The last one I did feet. But the one before that, I did the sanitation trends. So if you wanted to watch that. Um, but yeah, try to keep you up, Leon. Yeah, that <laughs> no, was good. Uh, yeah, but uh, or what are you saying? Um, did, I, did I miss something? Like, did you have any questions about the sanitation trends that I didn't cover in the video? What, what you trying to say, bro? Come at me. Come at me, bro. <laughs> no, was good. Uh, let me see. Let me chat it here. Um, any... Any question in particular about the sanitation trends? All right. So it's 4.05 now. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, the nine, nine of you who stuck through to the end. Oh, man, you guys are soldiers. You guys are soldiers, man. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, seriously, wow. Thank you guys so much for watching this. Um, and yeah, every week, Thursdays, I'll try to cover something different and email me if you have any ideas, um, any questions that you want me to address uh, while we're doing the show. Oh, um, who, who was that? I think it was uh, Naomi Clay who suggested that but to do a hashtag. Maybe I'll set something up like that. Um, if you hashtag June the, ask June the Groomer um, on Twitter or whatever, you know, 
Facebook, hashtag Ask You and the Groomer with your question, and you know I'll I'll, I'll look for those and answer it next week on the uh, on Ask You and the Groomer. Thank you guys so much.